Welcome and good morning. Let's just begin our morning by standing up and worshiping God.
into something new and something fresh, God. Mm
Good morning and welcome to Westside this morning. We are so glad that you made us a part of your Sunday plans. Whether you're online or in person, welcome. Go ahead and take a seat. So we hit June this week. And I know what some of you are thinking because your brains go there. So I got you. Christmas is 203 days away. <laughs> so get ready, people. Halfway through 2022, here we go. If you haven't started your resolutions, now's the time. I'm just kidding. If it's your first time here, again, extra special welcome. If you could reach in the seat pocket in front of you and grab this card, it's the Connect card, and fill it out, and then give it to one of our door holders at the end of the service. They have a gift for you, and we just want to connect with you and get to know you a little bit better and welcome you here this morning with us. Uh, there's also a link for those of you that are joining online uh, for the Connect card as well. So don't think that you are not thought of. Please click it. We'd love to connect with you in person or online. I just want to say a very special thank you on behalf of the youth. Last Sunday, we had the opportunity to partner with Urban um, Wesley Urban Ministries and do a food drive. And a lot of you helped and participated, and that was amazing. It was such a great service to see many of the generations through kids and youth. We had over 20 youth from the youth group come out to help do this. Uh, 250 flyers went out to the neighborhood. We did a sponsored ad on social media, and it was just such a well received. Uh, it was just awesome. So if we could, big round of applause for that. All the money that, we, or yeah, food that was raised. So you can see behind me on the one picture, this side, uh, is all the food and uh, many toiletries and special products and those kinds of things that were collected. And on the other side is Zach and Rob who filled both of their SUVs to go in and deliver that on Wednesday this week. They were so grateful and it's going to be so well used. And it was just such a blessing to be able to partner with the youth and have that and to do that and to help them uh, step into their community. There was even a gentleman walking by last week and he was like, what are you guys doing? And some of the youth explained what was going on and he just reached in and gave 20 bucks and was like, here. So it was just awesome to see the community come alongside that as well. Very exciting. And here at Westside, we don't get to do those kinds of things without the generous partnership of all of you here. If you would like to financially partner with us so that we can continue to build into the next generation and what we do here each week, there are many ways that you can do that. Obviously, number one, prayer always be praying for us. Be praying for us as a church. Be praying for our youth. Be praying for our staff. Everybody in those first and foremost. And secondly, financial tithing. Online giving is available at westsidehamilton.com slash give or in person through cash, check, and debit at the giving terminal in the lobby. Or you can automate your giving also in the seat pocket in front of you. There's a card. Uh, you can fill that out and hand it to one of our door holders and they will get you connected with that. Again, thank you so much if this is what you do. And if you can't, again, prayer is the most important part, the you, way you can partner with any church. I'm going to invite Pastor John up, and while uh, he comes up, I'm just going to pray. Please join me. God, you are so good, and we are so grateful for who you are in our lives. We thank you for the freedom and opportunity that we have to come here each week with open hearts and hands to worship and learn more about you. We thank you for the opportunity to grow in community with you and each other each week. We thank you for the youth, Lord, and the food drive, and we pray an extra blessing on each and every single item collected that it would multiply to just bless each and every family that it will be received with. You are so good, and we are so grateful. Thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Kaylee, thank you very much. And band, as always, thank you. That was an amazing way to start our Sunday. Uh, how many of you were here last week for the kids? Wasn't it an amazing service? I'm so sorry, you're going from the youngest to the oldest, right? I think that's the way we're going. But uh, as we are heading into June, uh, we're also heading into this new series called West Side Stories. You got it? You got it? West Side Stories. And so there are going to be four uh, people speaking for the next, uh, we have people speaking for the next four weeks that are from West Side, and we get to speak on whatever we want to speak on, whatever God's put in our hearts. And so my prayer is for you today 
that whatever God's put on my heart will also resonate with you as well. Um, I was going through a bit of a season last year, and uh, I was given this book by John Mark Comer called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I don't know if any of you have heard this book, but when I was first given this book, somebody said, well, you got to read it right away. And it's almost like the whole fact, the way they said it, made me go, I don't think that I'm right in the right space to read it. So it has been sitting on our bookshelf for quite a while. And then uh, Christy and I, we had a chance before we came here, we actually had a chance to go to uh, down south. Uh, we crossed the border just as the restrictions were changing a little bit, and uh, we went to, uh, to a beach in South Carolina, and so we were able to have a chance to be together, to slow down, and I had a chance to embrace this amazing book. And you know what they say, when you read a good book sometimes, when you read a good book, you want to share it with others. And so some of this book is what I'd like to share with you today. It brought to mind some things that I think are pretty important. So here, I'm going to give you a, bl- a glimpse at some things that I read. Uh, a few quotes, and then I'm actually going to read a short passage before we start to teach. Quote one, Jesus put on display an unhurried life where space for God and love for people were the top priorities. Quote two, I cannot live, oh, so that was John, John Mark Comer, the author, wrote that in his book. Quote two, I cannot live in the kingdom of God with a hurried life. That's by John Ortberg. And then quote three, you'll love this one. The attention span is decreasing each year. In 2000, the average attention span was 12 seconds. Now it's eight seconds. The attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. And that's written by a guy named Kevin McSpadden. You have a shorter attention span than a goldfish, and that's a blog post online. So here, let me read a short passage and uh, see how you resonate with this. Do you ever catch yourself with the the sneaking suspicion that you'll wake up on your deathbed with this nagging sense that somehow, in all the hurry and busyness and frenetic activity, you missed the most important things. Somehow you started a business, but ended a marriage. You got your kids to their dream colleges, but never taught them the ways of Jesus. You got got letters after your name, but learned the hard way that intelligence is not the same as wisdom. You made a lot of money, but you never grew rich in the things that matter most, which ironically aren't things at all. You watched all 14 seasons of whatever, but never learned to love prayer. This is the terrifying aspect of this conversation for me, John Mark Comer. Most of us waste copious amounts of time, myself included, For all the talk about hurry and overload, most of it is self-inflicted. Philip Zimbardo's recent research on the, quote, demise of guys in the crisis of masculinity in the Western culture has concluded that the average guy spends 10,000 hours playing video games by the age of 21. That's all I'll read. You can get the book or borrow mine. Enjoy the rest. So, um... Dave Steimers, the pastor of this church, and if you're new, I am not the pastor of the church, I'm one of the pastors here at the moment, and that would be he's on sabbatical. And so this kind of got me thinking a little bit about what maybe Dave would want to say to you after, how is he, is he a month on sabbatical now? I've lost track. Haven't even talked to him, so this is actually wonderful. And one of the things Dave actually said to me is, John, when you get a chance to speak, make sure you tell a little bit of your story. So this is really quickly, quickly, quickly a version of a story. Um... Christy and I have been married 33 years, told you that a few weeks ago. If you didn't hear our message, you can listen to that online. But we've been in ministry pretty much ever since we have been, uh, we've been married. So that's over 30 years in ministry. Spent four years in camp ministry, uh, spent another four years uh, as youth pastor of a church in Burlington, uh, spent 17 years actually after that pastoring youth pastors, and then I just fi- finished a stint as about seven years as a lead pastor uh, in Burlington. And do you know what's interesting? I find COVID the hardest thing in all of those years of ministry. And the amazing part about it, it's not maybe the same 
thing that you found hard about COVID, I don't think I realized till the, in the middle of COVID how hurried my life was, how fast-paced I was on, how much I was like the frog in the kettle. Do you know that illustration? By the way, apparently it's bogus, but anyway, it's a good illustration. The idea is, is that life just really caught up to me. And then, <clears throat> somewhere in the middle of not being able to, not being allowed, anyways, to be meeting um, uh, in person, I was having a meeting with another pastor from the church I was at and in our backyard. And in the middle of our conversation, he said, John, what is wrong with you? You are not the same person that you, have, that you were before. And he really challenged me. And I remember going, he's right. <laughs> I'm not at all. I was feeling really tired, really confused, super discouraged, really unsettled, sad, unhappy, exhausted, and quite frankly, the word that seemed to bring the whole thing together was, I was just downright grumpy. Can you guys relate with that? Remember that? I'm going to read a passage from Matthew 11, 28 to 30, and it might actually be um, extremely familiar to some of us, or maybe it's not as familiar to others of us, but maybe you can grab your phones. I think that the people are looking up the Bible on the phone these days, or maybe you actually have a Bible. Uh, but while you're doing that, I just want to bring to your attention one thing, is that uh, everybody, if you were given one of these cards on your seat, and um, we that's, uh, have decided to sort of tell you what's going on this summer, just to be right up front and really clear. By the way, June 5th, it's not, is this summer yet? I mean, it feels like summer. I'm wearing my summer shirt, but it's not really the season of summer yet. But we are actually bringing June and July and August together, and this is what we're going to be doing in the summertime. And so, like I said before, this is the first of actually a six-week series called West Side Stories. We're just going to do all of June and then, for West Side Stories, and uh, there you're going to see who's speaking. And I just want you know, to highlight a few of the dates. June 19th is Father's Day, so dads come, and we're going to have something special for you. And then on June 26th, we will have another communion service. And then in July, and this is going to be pretty exciting, this is uh, something I'm pretty happy with, is that we're doing a series called A City Connected, and we are bringing in some pastors from Hamil the Hamilton area, and each one of them is going to speak about what uh, their church is doing in Hamilton, and then they're also going to give us a brief, a, a brief teach. And so we have a church planter, we have a network, uh, uh, um, Dave Witt is part of a True City network, Robin Waller works with Lyft Church uh, with McMaster, but he works with student ministry, and then Marcio Silva, I'm really excited about Marcio, had a coffee with him this week, he works with immigrant and refugee families, especially a Brazilian church, and uh, he's going to be coming in, so I think that's an amazing uh, amazing week. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about Sabbath Sunday, but there you go. Everybody, make sure, take it home. We don't have this in the digital version, do we? Anyway, maybe we'll, we will have it. I don't know. I'm sure Zach will figure that one out, but uh, we are pretty excited uh, for the summertime. And so while Dave Steimers is away, we're giving you a beautiful gift. And I'm also to dry. Okay, let's, uh, let's go to this passage um, from Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11, 28, 29, and 30. <clears throat> this is the NIV. New International Version says this. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's read it again. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I think sometimes we make the mistake of um, reading scripture a little too fast, and we don't really let it speak to us deeply. 
apparently wine's the same way. I don't know wine. But apparently if you aerate it, is that right? It's better. And so maybe we can just pretend like this scripture is a bit of wine aerating on us a little bit today. Because why? We don't want to miss this. Is that in this one small passage, Jesus gives us four promises. A promise for rest for the weary. A promise that he's going to be gentle. A promise for deep rest to the very core of our soul. And Jesus promises his yoke is to be easy. I love how Jesus illustrates stories. And a few weeks ago I was saying, Jesus like usually sees the crowd and then brings an illustration to who the crowd is. And this is an interesting one, this idea of yoke. Because in this passage, if you read a little bit more, and we don't have time today, but the early part of this is that the disciples were actually sent already, Jesus had said to the disciples, go, I want you to do the things that I've been telling, that you've been learning from me. And then John the Baptist, he's actually in jail, and he's hearing about Jesus, and he's going, he says to his disciples, his followers, go and talk to Jesus and ask him a few questions. And at the end of this passage, just before we read these verses, Jesus actually is saying to the disciples, okay, go, it's actually time to like, get out of here, and to, the, and to John the Baptist's followers, it's time to go back to John and tell him what I've said. Now here's what's interesting. It's not the words that I notice here, it's the fact they go. <laughs> Why a yoke? They went city to city, they would travel city to city, and they would journey through a ton of farmland. And when you're journeying through farmland, they're going to see a lot of farmers and a lot of cattle. So what is this yoke used in farming? It's actually this, like you see on this picture, a wooden beam, and it's normally put between a pair of ox or other animals to, to enable them to pull together a load that they could never pull on their own. They would need it in pairs. So as oxen usually do, some yokes are fitted specifically for the individual animals. And there are several types of yokes used in different cultures. But what we talk about here, what we're talking about is that this yoke is designed to be helping one helps another. And so what does it mean when Jesus says, that his yoke is easy. Because I don't know, when I think of yoke and cattle, I think of hard work. And so what we really are looking at here is that this idea of yoke isn't necessarily, this idea of working together, but this idea of yoke actually being easy really works towards more that the fact of Jesus was a rabbi. And rabbis in Jesus' time would be qualified teachers of this thing called the Torah or the Jewish scripture. Um, that's the first five books of, the, of what we call the Bible, or the five books of Moses. And here's what's amazing, is that in Jesus' time, and quite frankly for a long time, maybe not as much today, is that all Jewish kids would knew, know the Hebrew Scripture. They'd memorize them. Have you guys ever read Leviticus? Memorize Leviticus. So what you're looking at here is when Jesus is speaking and saying, my yoke is easy, he's actually speaking my teaching is easy. My way of life is easy. This is what the yoke is. So how, um, let me ask you this for a second before I get into this next thought. Do we follow, we might not follow the same Jewish rabbis, but I think those of us that have been in the church for many, many years follow a similar pattern is that we follow teachers. We follow preachers. And in fact, what's interesting is, is that over COVID, many people were introduced to many new teachers that they wouldn't get on Sunday because you're sitting at home and it's like, well, I don't like him. Oh, she's teaching. Oh, her voice is a little too scratchy. Um, oh, look at this. He teaches the Bible. This person does. This is what we do. We get to pick and choose and see, whatever. And so part of it, I believe, is that what Jesus is saying here is that you can choose whatever teaching, but if you choose me, my teaching, my yoke, my way is light. My way is light. It's gentle. So let's think for a second here, and let me, um, 
let's look at what it means to follow Jesus' teaching. And it's really hard to put, it, to, to put this into a synopsis other than in the book of Galatians, we read that if you're a follower of Jesus, here are some things that you should be known for. And we call these the fruit of the Spirit. So let's do a little bit of a checklist for how you're doing on your fruit of the Spirit. This is what a follower of Jesus normally is. Do you have that slide? Just want to make sure that everybody... There we go, sorry. This is actually the yoke of Jesus. You don't have to put up your hand. How are you doing on love? How are you doing on peace? How are you doing on joy and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? I actually think that when the person who was sitting in my backyard was saying, John, you're not yourself, he's saying, you are not full of love. You do not have any peace in you. Where'd the joy go? Holy cow, you are impatient. You're not kind. Where'd that goodness go? You get the idea. And so when you look in the mirror, he was right. He was like, I am not acting like I have, am a follower of Jesus. Now, here's the part that I just want to give us a break on, is that G I believe that these are the types of, hmm, how do I say this? These are the types of qualities that the world needs in us so that we don't look like those angry Christians that say we're following Jesus. There's no anger in here. <laughs> There's no mad in here. There's nothing but gentleness and kindness. Um, do, any, do you guys follow the Enneagram? Some of you do. I think it's a big thing these days. Maybe some of you don't. Maybe it's more you do Briggs and Myers or some of these other things. Well, in the Enneagram, uh, it's a self-diagnosis tool, I guess is what you would say, is um, there's a version of who I am that God made me to be that when I'm actually doing well, these are the things that you would see in me. These are my strengths. These are the things that people like being in me. It's like a coin. There's one side of the coin is all the things that are apparently beautiful about me. But then the other side is, the other side of the coin is when I'm not healthy, when I'm healthy, these things come out. But when I'm unhealthy, the opposite occurs. Actually, kind of bad things kind of occur. Like things that really turn people off. And I'm only using that as a bit of an example of these are the things that happen, I think, when we don't project the fruit of the Spirit, is that we actually can be the last thing. Okay, so the checklist is, how many of these things in the fruit of the Spirit actually can you say you're doing well in? Let's go back to the checklist. Um, love, peace, and joy actually... Okay, let's forget all of those except love, peace, and joy. They were the... Probably in Jesus' day, when Jesus was preaching, his followers would say, excuse me, people that would see Jesus and his followers would say, these people are people of love. These people are people of peace. These people are people of joy. So let's forget patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. How are we at least doing with love, joy, peace? <laughs> okay, if that's not working, let's just stick with one, and that is love. You got it? Um, uh, when a rich young ruler comes to Jesus and asks him, kind of like, you know, all the other rabbis are teaching all of this stuff, but you, rabbi, um, what is the greatest commandment that you can actually tell me? Like, don't tell me the whole thing. Just tell me the, the thing that really counts, the smallest thing. He comes back and says, the great commandment is to love God and love others. That's it. I think the yoke, I think the teaching that Jesus gives us is pretty easy. It's pretty easy. And I, why is this on my heart today? It's because we need to be people that reflect following Jesus and just make it easy for others. Let's love God, love others. Let's love God, love others. Jesus' yoke is easy. The band, if you guys want to come up again, I've asked them to sing a song. Andrew, you guys are good to come. 
And so part of our service today, I'd like the band to play a song, and I'd love you to sit and reflect on the words of this song. And then I'm going to come up and actually close with a bit of application for what we've been talking about today. But before I do that, um, I read this passage from the NIV. If some of you have the message, it's another different version of this passage. And so I'd like to read this passage from the message before the band sings. And it says this. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I'm going to bring some closing thoughts after the band. But just in a spirit of just reflection, please listen and participate in these in this song.
was so good. I was realizing that I was just sitting, I was thinking, oh, you guys think that's the, the quickest message ever, don't you? Still have a few more things to say. The other part of that verse that stands out, yoke stands out, but the other part is focusing on your soul. It's so hard to explain actually what a soul is. It's harder than you think. Our soul is actually part of our interior, our deepest part of our interior being. And it's something that many of us, if not most of us, just do not take the time to nurture and then even mature. So I borrowed um, from Pete Cesaro of Emotionally Healthy Discipleship a little illustration that he uses, and I believe it actually is a good indicator of the soul. And he talks about each one of us is made up in different ways, physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual. That's who we are. We're not beings that are one of these. We're beings that are all of these. And so probably one of the reasons why we don't nourish or nurture our soul is because we focus on probably one or two of these areas and we get out of balance. And in fact, probably in our church settings, especially those of us from evangelical churches, focus so much on the intellectual side that we probably are out of balance even in that way. And if there's anything we do, we ignore the signs to slow down. And so the reason why I'm bringing this up is because at Westside for this summer, we want to make a commitment to help you nurture your soul, not just nurture the intellectual part of who we are. <laughs> that would be to help nurture every part of this, of even this, uh, this illustration, our physical, our emotional, our social, our intellectual, and our spiritual. Because heading into the fall, I would love for us to be a church that isn't grumpy. <laughs> But if there's one of those things that we are off that checklist is we are full of love. And if we have mercy and joy and peace that are, or joy and peace that are joining, that's wonderful. And if any one of those other things we're checking, we're at least heading in the right direction of being healthy. So what's the main point of today? I say the main point of today is, is that the most loving thing <clears throat> that you can do for you and everyone around you is to slow down and cultivate your walk with God. I'll just say it again. The most loving thing you can do for you and for those around you, everyone around you, is to slow down and cultivate your walk with God. So here's how we're going to help for the summer. Here's some three practical ways <clears throat> that we're committed to do that. So, so um, we, we are saying this is a summer of soul care. What do you need to do? You need to find something you really enjoy. Can you think of something? You, that you really enjoy, and do it. I love golf, and I love motorcycling. There you go. Had a chance even yesterday, while our ribs were cooking, right, Christy? to go out and have a beautiful motorcycle ride. Now, I know that's not for everybody, and I know some of you are going to tell me how dangerous it is afterwards. Fine, I get it. <clears throat> I'm just being up front. I love golfing, and I love motorcycle riding. Here's what's interesting. I love motorcycle riding because I can be on my own, in my own headspace, and on a road, quite frankly, just relaxing. Where we live, I can... Uh, where did I go yesterday? Almost down to the Grand River but I'm on my own with my own thoughts, whatever. That's why I love motorcycling. Do you know why I love golf? Because I can hang out with people. And I can actually enjoy their game is way better than mine. <laughs> but I can talk, and I can just have a fun time. Sometimes there's serious discussions, sometimes just joking. But those are some of the areas for me. So find something that you really enjoy and do it. Second thing is, are you taking time off or taking time away? Slowing down means to shut down very often and just to get away, to take time off or to get away. I hope you're doing that. 
try a Sabbath day each week. And Sabbath actually is designed to be with others. The final one is called solitude. But here, let's stick on Sabbath for... Christy and I have uh, been doing a Sabbath day every Friday uh, for seven years now. And it's been transformative. Uh, Well, at least not during COVID it was tough, right? But anyway, because we're with each other all the time then. But anyway, but the reason why... Okay, that's a whole other sermon, but okay. (laughs) And I know it's hard. It's hard with your kids and whatever. But do you have a time when you can say, we are setting aside a day or half a day to be with my spouse, to be with my family, to be with people who really give me life. I would just encourage you, if that is something you can do, to try it. And then if you're up to it, maybe you're already doing okay, and you're healthy, and maybe it's time for you to do the thing called solitude, and that is to take time away from people and to be intentionally having some time alone with God. Whatever these four things are, I would just love to encourage you, is that you need some soul care and make this summer about caring for your soul. Secondly, at the church, we're doing this thing called Summer Serve. Now, until you are, we need help at church on Sundays to make programs function and run. But, hear me, until you are well rested, do not volunteer. You got that? We don't need you grumpy with our kids. No. I think some of us believe we rest by serving, and that sometimes can happen, but we really need to find rest. And if you're not ready yet, please do not volunteer. But some of you, if you are feeling well enough rested, we could use a bit of help, because there are some volunteers here that have been carrying the load for a while. And so in a few weeks... Uh, We're going to be handing out um, probably a sheet or Zach will probably make something that we'll have an opportunity to serve one or a couple of weeks in the future over the summertime. That would be more July and August. But you can be starting to pray about that if you're starting to feel that you're ready to go a little bit. And then the last one, if you're ready to go, we have a place for you to serve. So bottom line, if you're good, ready, you're rested, this is all a bunch of like, John, I can't believe you're sharing this, I'm good, we could use you to serve. But especially for the fall, Uh, We're going to be adding some programs, especially in kids' ministry, especially with junior high, and we're going to be looking at some things like that that we're going to be telling you in the future. And then the final one that I'd like to leave with you today is, is that we are going to do something called Sabbath Sunday. And Sabbath Sunday means that we are not having a service on Sunday, July 31st. Now, if you're saying, oh, because you don't have any volunteers... Part of it is that's actually normally a weekend, which is one of the lowest attended weekends. It's hardest to find people. But we want to be intentional. We would like to, we would like to take a Sunday we, where we as a church intentionally slow down. Now, the word Sabbath, do it with other people. So that if, you're, if you can be on your own, fine. But if you can be with family or friends or maybe meet new friends, we're going to talk about this in the future because maybe we can have a few families opening up pools we can invite to or we can do some, maybe golf, hey, (laughs) or maybe like whatever it is that we just slow down and nourish our soul. Remember, don't feel guilty that the intellect part, (laughs) we're doing okay with that. But some of the other part, especially the part of of the social and emotional and some of these other things, we need to work on a little bit. And so as a church, we want to model that by actually taking a Sunday off. Is is this like crazy? Are you going to fire me now? You probably are, but that's okay. Dave's away. (laughs) Because we're going to come back in August, actually, and Dave's coming back in August. And uh, if you see on the summer schedule, oh, by the way, yeah, I did... I did, um, I did forget to, to point out a couple of things. July 17th, we're having a summer cookout or a barbecue. We're going to do that in the park across the street, so put that in your calendar. And then the other thing is, is that um, when Dave comes back, Dave and Bryna and the family come back on August 21st, we're going to do ice cream, and we're going to have a celebration of ice cream after. So uh, um, we'll talk to you a bit more of that in the future. I think that's it for today. Um, Christy and I are hoping that um, we can raise the bar of prayer and a culture of prayer in our community 
uh, through the summer and heading into the fall. And so I've asked Christy if she doesn't mind coming up and finishing our service with something called community prayer. And, uh, and then we'll let you go. Let's pray. Yeah, and to raise the culture of prayer, what we want to do is we want Jesus to be our first response. When anything comes up in our lives, the culture of prayer just means we turn to Jesus and we look at Jesus and we ask Jesus, what are you saying? What are you wanting? And so that's what the culture of prayer that we are wanting to raise is. And I'll just uh, say, if anybody today needs a little bit of extra prayer, uh, I'll hang out somewhere around here. And if you want some prayer after, please come on up and I'd love to pray with you and for you. Okay, let's just close in prayer. Our Father God, we thank you for your invitation to rest. Thank you that you promise when we're weary and when we're heavy laden, you are our rest. And we take you up on that invitation. And Lord, for those who are burden today for those who are so weary and tired and feeling broken and hurt or whatever it may be, thank you for your promise to be rest. Thank you for your promise to be peace. Thank you for your promise to fill us with love so that we can love others. Jesus, we pray for um, Dave and Bryna and Joe and Elsie as they're taking their sab sabbatical. And we ask for rest for them in mm -hmm. deep in their souls. I pray not only for rest, I pray for them for fun and joy and laughter and fantastic memories for them as a family together during this time. Jesus, I pray for um, the summer as we look ahead and, and we hear what, what is going to be happening here at Westside in the summer. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would begin working and preparing all of those who are going to speak and us as we listen so that we can hear clearly your voice, so that we can follow clearly your voice, so that we can be people who live and love and move and serve out of who you are in us. And so, Jesus, today, as we've learned about soul rest and soul care, would you, Holy Spirit, remind us? Would you help us to see those areas in our lives where we need to have intentional rest? Would you show us how to do it? And would you bring us into um, company of other people that we can press into this together so that we are people who reveal you through our rest, through our peace, through our joy, and through our love. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Go in peace and don't forget your children. Bless you.